Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Gäste, ich begrüße Sie heute. Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, I welcome you cordially to our second digital event. Today we deal with parliamentarism during the Corona crisis. Yes, these times face us with big challenges. We have important decisions to take, whether they concern our lender, the federal level, or the European level. And a democracy requires that parliaments meet in order to take decisions. Therefore, personal presence is required. The European Parliament solves the problem by allowing a vote on the federal level and in the lender, things are different. But what characterizes democracy? Not only difficult situations, but also the way towards them. Committees meet, experts have to be listened to, and the debate within Parliament is required before taking decisions. Yes. The corona crisis has changed a lot. The way decisions are taken are quicker. Have they been improved? Is democracy being respected as we expect? This is what we are going to discuss today. I particularly welcome Klaus Weller. Klaus Weller is the general director of the European Parliament. He has had this role for many years, and he knows how politics are run in the European Parliament. I'm pleased that he is at our disposal to discuss with us today. Democracy in times of the Corona crisis, parliamentarism in times of the Corona crisis, and at last time, Mr. Kafsak, the correspondent of the Frankfurt Allgemeine newspaper, is going to ask questions to Mr. Weller, and he has the opportunity to participate. We have chosen a new format, which we improve steadily in order for you to participate directly. You can also listen to us in English. We have made the arrangements for that as well. I hope you are going to enjoy our event, and I'm already looking forward to the third one, but I would prefer to see you back in real life. Die Schriftstellerin Karen Duva hat mal geschrieben in einem ihrer Bücher, ähm, Liebe ist, wenn eine Glasscheibe zwischen mir und der Realität ist. Sicherlich ein Satz, der in diesen Zeiten etwas anders klingt, aus einer anderen Zeit stammt, und wir lieben es sicherlich in dieser Form nicht, aber die Umstände es erlauben, es nicht anders. Ähm, herzlich willkommen von meiner Seite äh, zu diesem zweiten Video, zu dieser zweiten Videodiskussion, muss man besser sagen, in Zeiten der Corona-Krise aus der hessischen Landesvertretung in Brüssel. Nach dem Gespräch mit Herrn Hager, Kabinettschef von Herrn Dombrovskis in der vergangenen Woche, spreche ich heute mit Klaus Welle, Generalsekretär des Europäischen Parlaments. Seit Jahrhunderten kann man noch nicht sagen, aber seit Jahrzehnten inzwischen schon beinahe elf Jahre sind es genau genommen. Ähm, wir wollen heute reden darüber, wie sich die Corona-Krise auf die Arbeit des Parlaments ausrichtet, äh, auswirkt, was es für Konsequenzen hatte. Und wir haben wie letztes Mal auch eine knappe Dreiviertelstunde Zeit, äh, um miteinander zu reden, aber auch Ihnen, um Ihnen zu erlauben, von außen Fragen zu stellen. Einige sind schon eingetrudelt, aber... An dieser Stelle noch von meiner Seite die Aufforderung an Sie auf der anderen Seite dieser Glasscheibe vor Ihren Computerbildschirmen, vor Ihren Handys, wo auch immer Sie sitzen, Fragen an uns zu schicken, die wir dann gerne anschreiben. Herr Welle, fangen wir gleich an mit dem Gespräch. Ganz so geht es. Schreiben Sie mal, was das Ganze für die Krise bedeutet für die Arbeit des Parlaments. Es ist ja eine fundamentale andere Arbeit, die das Wellen musste. To change fundamentally. So the last month has, of course, lots of adaptations with it. We've had, we've pursued three goals to our staff, our visitors, and the members of parliament have to be protected as well as possible. We have to make sure, as a second goal, that the European democracy uh, continues to function continued activity, and of course we try to set an example for practical solidarity with the cities where we are active, Brussels and Luxembourg, Strasbourg. We want to protect our staff, everybody that has a high risk factors, be it uh, lung disease, heart disease, being treated for cancer, those people are at high risk, so those are the first to be, of course, be full time remote work and in general for everyone for whom it's possible will work from home. 
This is, of course, a huge adaptation. It's also a huge step forward in regards to modernization with the public administration, with everything that's linked to it. So do you have to imagine it that the parliament building is mostly empty? Well, it's not completely empty. About 10% of staff are there, but we're mostly working via video conferences. Many other people in Europe work the same way, of course, and within the management uh, and the works fairly easily, more administrative tasks, but we have uh, more challenges compared to a national parliament because we have to bring people together from 27 member states with 24 languages, which means that as far as committees are concerned, we cannot use standard programs as they are available to everybody. But we have to develop with a Lithuanian company, jointly developing a program that offers simultaneous interpretation in six languages during the meeting, which allows for committing meetings, leadership meetings, we have a uh, conference meeting. So it's not Skype or Zoom, what everyone is using at home for their uh, working from home, even if the question about the safety of Zoom has been publicly asked before. Uh, we are developing our own tool in cooperation with a Lithuanian company that will give us the opportunity to have a video conference with uh, for our own uh, simultaneous interpretation. We have demonstrated in March that it is possible with up to six languages, up to 100 active participants in the meeting. And that's a huge step forward because now we can have a remote committee meeting. We can have a conference of the group leader, parliamentary group leaders. We can have uh, meetings of a single parliamentary group online. So the parliamentary activity in itself is not suspended. It's continue with these means, with these tools, we can continue to do parliamentary activity and work even if it is not as lively as it would otherwise be. We can continue to work, we can continue to take decisions and be available for the people, which is of course very important because we have to be able to legislate. And on a technical level this works uh, properly because uh, I'm asking because we had difficulties yesterday just to get it to work. Uh, we have managed to print on a 25,000 uh, uh, copies of our paper, but you can see that there are technological limits to what we're trying to do right now. Well, it's, of course, uh, an ongoing procedure. We're all still learning. Everyone that's uh, part of it learns every time. The first time is very hard. The second time is better. And the third time, it starts to get good. And that's how this works. Normally, you'll have a six-month testing phase before you launch anything of this. Now we have to learn by doing. We have to learn while we're doing, but we've had good experiences with the leaders of the parliamentary groups. The Liberal group has, with 90, has a meeting with 90 active participants. We have had 20 meetings of that type with different types of technical difficulties occurring, but in general, we keep improving our performance and we're trying to extend this from 100 to 200 to 400 active participants from 6 to 8 to 24 language we have to, we try to scale this up it'll take some month but we have to expect that for the next 18 months there will not be a vaccine that's at least what we have to assume. And we think that there will continue to be limitations, not as strong limitations as we are living under now, but there will probably continue to be limitations. Now, so you, you've mentioned 18 months, so you expect that for about 18 months, everything will be rem done remotely, not everything in Parliament. We have to keep up uh, with the science, of course. I am basing this on a study by the Imperial College in London that basically states that the huge wave of infection is happening now up to the summer, and if we are patient enough with our measures, it will flatten greatly, but you can always have a contagion without symptoms. So we will have smaller outbreaks that might require stronger measures again, so there will it will be going up and down. So measures will be taken back, then numbers might climb up again, so measures will be reintroduced, then after numbers go down again, they will be taken away again. So because if there's this asymptous contagion, uh, short distances are putting everyone at risk. 
And that, of course, makes our meetings very complicated. We can still have them, but we have, of course, to try to minimize the risk as far as possible and to have maybe less participants than we would otherwise have. Yeah, let, I'm going to jump straight uh, to a question by one of our viewers, Andrei Kneister. If we talk about debate in Parliament, it's taking place in a limited form. So the, what he wants to know is debate in Parliament is one of the core principles of parliamentarianism. How can you ensure this if this is happen, happening virtually, remotely? Well, so far we have different forums, we have the plenary of Parliament as the core activity, and we had important speakers of every parliamentary fracture, every parliamentary group, but we didn't have all the members of the Parliament, and the voting was done remotely. The debate, of course, is limited. In the committees, we can already have a video debate that will not have the same quality, of course, as, having in, as being in the same room together, but you can ask for the flow remotely. You will get the word. Everybody will be able to hear you. So it's not as good as being locally present itself is, but it's going further than just being able to vote or sh do short statements. I think it's a permanent learning uh, procedure because you've heard uh, from uh, members of parliament uh, that the video conference is a little bit weird because you can see the wallpaper of a colleague or you can see a poster of another colleague that you might find interesting, but you don't, it really shouldn't be part of your political opinion of someone or part of the political context. So do you think we all have to learn a little bit more about how this works and then it'll work or do you see some limits on what can be done with this? Well, you can see it humanizes members of parliament because it can be interesting to see how they live. I, I do not think this is a deficit of the system. Would rather be a problem if it was a disadvantage for uh, a member of parliament if they live in a region where broadband uh, reception isn't that good. Uh, we have contacted all members of parliament. Eleven of them have requested aid, so we will be having them with equipment in order to ensure that everybody can participate equally on in the parliamentary debate. Yeah, but that, of course, uh, means that, for example, we're talking about 5G. Okay, well, we're not at 5G yet, but we're talking about 4G and 3G in some parts uh, of Germany, for example, that aren't properly covered. So this, of course, speeds up that debate as well. Well, for our president, uh, two things are very important. Participation has to be fair. There has to be a level of fairness. So we have this problem. So if somebody has difficulties, we will equip them in order to get rid of these difficulties. And we also need to have authentication because we have to be absolutely certain that the person participating uh, is the real member of parliament. This could be a problem in votes. So as authentication is mandatory, which brings us to the next question by Hans Dorsten how such a secret vote can happen, because it has to be sure that such a vote happens and that the vote is secret, is anonymous in a way, because uh, these connections are always vulnerable to hackers and attacks and security, uh, security vulnerabilities. Our concern is not that much. The secrecy of the vote is a secret vote. And one can require the names regarding the votes which occur in Parliament, and this is what we did last time. This gave us a certain safety, and then the votes were casted as the members of Parliament had required, so we could read the results of the votes afterwards. And so the secrecy of the votes is not that much a hurdle as those secret votes don't happen for the moment. We, in fact, have gone over to votes linked to the names as uh, this is what the members required. 
how does such a vote happen? How can I make sure that not the 13-year-old son of the member of parliament votes instead of his father or his mother? For the moment, we use email and uh, we also have uh, pictures, photos of the members concerned uh, in order for the member to control his vote afterwards. And technically speaking, there are other possibilities. Uh, we also have um, the possibility to enter a digital signature when one wants to adjust an agreement. We could imagine that those systems are going to be developed further, which would allow us to go over to more complex voting systems. Lots of time, the situation was quite easy. We had a lot of agreement, politically speaking. It was not a sensitive issue. And therefore, there was a high symbolic value attached to that vote. But we'll certainly be faced with situations which are more complex and we also need quick procedures which uh, should enable and allow us to modify a decision taken afterwards. And with regards to that, you are preparing things to prepare for the worst case, but it hasn't been implemented yet. Yes, we are working on this as the administration of the European Parliament always has to be ready. Whenever there are political decisions, they have to be implemented very quickly. So we're working on such a system, and uh, in a very short time, we'll be able to allow those uh, complex voting systems. But whether there will be a political will for that, uh, well, that remains to see. But in that case, we cannot say we start reflecting now. We should always be ready to implement the political way. And therefore, you are not preparing an ideal world, but you at least are making possible to come to complexer responses. When you have a lot of agreement, it is uh, rather easy to work with the means we have at our disposal currently. Once there is a lot of discussion, it becomes more complicated. Exactly. It is clear that we might be faced with such a situation in the short run, maybe not next time or next or maybe not um, at the meeting afterwards. But uh, members should be able to utter themselves in a more differentiated way. And this is what we are preparing for. But we haven't taken any political decisions. But you are not doing too well. Not that afterwards we'll get the question, why do we still go to Strasbourg or why do we still meet in Brussels? Considering the technical means we use, we all have to consider and are being faced with the limits of um, the systems we have. Um, once you don't see each other, if you cannot speak before and after the meeting, with the persons concerned. It is just a an, an, an kind of urgent measure, and it is not full parliamentarism. How about the members of parliament? Do they still come to Brussels? How many of them continue to come? Some 75 to 100 members of parliament still come to Brussels, not only Belgian or Luxembourgish members, not only Belgians. At the last plenary meeting, members of the north of Italy asked themselves the questions whether they should return home and get back to Brussels. How about uh, the risks? 
and the one or as a member decided to stay in Brussels to fulfill his or her task. Do you have the impression that most of the members are in Brussels or uh, most of the members uh, stay or do most of the officials stay in their respective member states? And the officials have to stay, must be in Brussels. But we also have some exceptional situations members or, um, or rather sorry uh, officials who have requested to look after their children or parents and therefore they work in the framework of home office and creation officials also are in these exceptional situations because of the earthquake regarding our personnel. We also have to deal with the question, how about those who during the weekends have to see their partner or their spouses or husbands? We still have to deal with those questions. And, um, I'm thinking of um, our freelance interpreters as well, who cannot come for the moment. So we touch up on our limits when it comes to the working of our plenary meetings. They cannot join your meeting. Well, there are a lot of reservations. Interpreters say we cannot deliver qualitative work, qualitative work from our home. We also have our conference technicians who are very critical about the quality of their work. We also need fire brigades. In some work, we had the problem that many of our personnel coming from the north of France, which was a very risky region, couldn't come anymore, which led us to the fact that we are only able to use two of our four buildings. We have a lot of uh, assistance through video conferencing, so we always need a lot of our personnel, and in every single situation, we decide what exception we can grant to certain specific groups. And for you personally, and emotionally speaking, do you sometimes wish for the contacts with members of parliament? Do you sometimes say to yourself, I can only stand this one more week? Or haven't you thought of that yet? I would plead for your second statement. It's um, a real exceptional situation if the management no longer can work, politics can no longer be run, and therefore we are fully required to ensure our parliamentary work and during the last week. We came across different critical situations, and, and we always took the right steps to continue to work. I'm looking at our audience to find out whether there are additional questions from them. I see two notes coming over to me. I just wait a little second for them to come and before I pursue our discussion. One question, which we have already replied to partially, at least. Mr. Wilhelm, I also call on, on the ladies to ask questions. Klaus Wilhelm asks the following question. We already have talked about the works going on, being run in the parliament. How about requests for adjustments and modifications? 
Well, we have come back to the system we used for the last plenary session, and this is a system we apply to the committee meeting. But there will be a conference today, right now, which is going to decide about the way to proceed. Very often we need a gentleman's agreement and a reasonable way to deal with each other. If we would have 100 requests for adjustments, of course, the committee would be faced quickly to its limits. Yes, this is what we said. These are the circumstances which uh, render our lives more difficult. Um, the development project I have described is going on until June. We hope that step by step, every month, every week, we will be able to deliver adequate quality. But then we would need more political decisions and the question of whether we want to go forward into this direction or not. And can Parliament, for instance, meet again? We also have technical links between some committee meetings. We would be able to organize plenary sessions in Brussels if we stick to social distancing. Parliamentarians would be in two conference rooms and there would be a technical link between the two meeting rooms, and, but we could safeguard. Technology has exchange been between the rooms. So we hope that this will work uh, if the situation continues to become a little easier. We can imagine that this digital development is not as necessary and that we can get back to having actual votes on site, but that's only if we can guarantee security and safety. You say it's a political decision. Who takes that political decision? Because this is not something you decide on your own as a one-person team. Is this the uh, table of presidents? Who, who takes that decision? Well, that's the decision that the presidents would prepare political, politically, would be voted in the different parliamentary groups where there are different opinions on this. Afterwards, the presidium would have to take uh, detailed decisions about how such a meeting would have to go because they would have to stipulate the rules for electronic votes. They can take a decision, and they have done so uh, ahead of the last plenary meeting that electronic voting, distant voting is allowed. If we want to introduce another system, this would require a new decision by the president. The current system has been approved until summer break. And currently, there are no diverging opinions that certain groups, uh, for example, say that we have to vote in person, otherwise it will not be as legitimate. So the current system and the last plenary meeting, all parliamentary groups have supported this. Almost all, everyone has supported this. If you say almost all groups, I would be, gay, be very curious. I, can you tell me who? No, I can, of course not. But we almost unanimously, the system was supported. But there are some groups that say we could go further, and others say let's move cautiously. So going further means be more virtual, more electronic, more remote. Yes, for example, the question, could you also intervene in a plenary debate as a member of parliament uh, virtually? Are there other means of voting in the plenary? And that's where opinions diverge within parliamentary groups and with, well, between groups and within groups. And in the end, necessity will probably be the deciding factor in 
this question when we have when we have a situation where a decision is absolutely necessary, but it's not too complicated. We can make it work with the current system, and in the hope that we can get back to have uh, parliamentary presence, uh, we won't need to go much further. But if it becomes necessary, of course, do that. Are there other questions about practical working and running of the parliament? Um, I have another question that looks interesting, but let's start, let's do this by topic and look at the working and running of Parliament first. There is one more, okay. Um, I'm going to get that question in a second, because I think, as far, especially as far as democratic control is concerned, practical aspects are very relevant, very important, and we should really look at everything. And we finally got a question by a woman, Barbara von von Zari, if I read her name correctly. So after overcoming the corona crisis, will these video conferences, so this, apparently this talks about over categorization. I'm not, I, so I, I, I'm a, I apologize, I cannot properly read what is on this note, but I understand the question as such that what will happen with these teleconferences um, after overcoming the crisis? Is this something that can be used in a certain context or not? Mr. Kafsa, I believe we cannot just go back to the status quo we've had before. What we will keep or we won't keep, that will depend on what things prove useful. We will certainly have much more working from home. Formats have been developed. Some are happy with it, others aren't. But it will be, we will certainly all become more flexible with this. And as far as the parliament is concerned, I think that the platform that we're developing right now uh, can be used to be closer to the citizens. That was one of the weak points uh, of the system that you could only listen. But if we had a system where you could use your smartphone, your iPad, whatever you're using, that allows you to uh, directly observe such a debate, that creates new possibilities for a dialogue resistance. So do you think it could even have a positive impact on uh, the de democratic accessibility of debates? Absolutely, I think we will have the technological possibilities to have a direct exchange with citizens wherever they are. And it could be an important tool for the future of Europe that in order to avoid that one person is being active and everybody else is just listening and passing on to have a more involved discussion. I think this, these aspects are something that will be kept. As far as everything else is concerned, we'll have to wait and see what kind of experiences we make of it, what, ha what is being valued and what isn't. It'll be somewhere between what we're having now and what we've had before. Another question, Hildegard Claire asked this, directly asking about the trialogue and committees. Is this a, how that happens? Does it happen at all? So on a practical level, this is very difficult right now. I don't think we're having trialogue committees or meetings right now. But what we've done, we've had uh, what we call white weeks in the past, so weeks that weren't that couldn't be used for parliamentary activity. We do not have one of these uh, until summer break, so people are available for remote. Uh, one for the parliamentary group and the rest mostly for the committees and these committees can be used how the committees want with simultaneous interpretation for all the activities they want to do. So we, in principle, we have a tool available to us that could be used for these situations. So we could have a meeting of co well, we have meetings of coordinators, meetings of committees, but you could also have uh, meetings with participants from other institutions. And now I see more and more questions coming in, which is great, because that means that we're actually reaching people. We have a bit of time left. Erich Heidkamp asks, the tendency 
uh, from going from unanimity to qualified majority seems to be the proper way. How do you see this, especially as far as uh, Corona bonds are concerned? Now we are getting into the political questions. Uh, I'm going to tackle this question differently. There is currently a huge debate about financial instruments, and if Europe is sufficiently active in this, and I think we can see one huge source of progress that we go to the financial crisis, which is that most of the tools and instruments that took years to set up during and after the financial crisis, that all of these tools can now be used very quickly. The European Stability Mechanism, ESM, says we have 410 billion available. The European Central Bank says uh, we do what it takes. Uh, 750 billion, uh, I think, are mobilized by that. European Investment Bank, 50 billion of credits and insurance. If I uh, once again, if I remember the numbers correctly, there's a number of tools that took a lot of effort to build up during and after the financial crisis. That took a long time. So, uh, yes, but uh, are now functioning in this situation after just a few weeks. Since we, there's uh, some questions about conditionality with DSM, but they are or will be available. And if you look, if you add for 10 billion, 50 billion, and 50 billion, this will add up to quite a huge number. And now the question is, are there any instruments going beyond this? The European Commission has made the suggestion, the proposal of a reinsurance scheme for jobless and this is being discussed as well. Can there be a shared European bond? Is that possible? Now this is a risk for the member states. So that is not something that can be decided with a qualified majority in the current situation. This is a risk the states assume. So this requires coordination on state level and that of course takes more time to set up than if we can see you can decide this on uh, union level uh, i assume you will not want to give a statement on your personal opinion on the corona bonds uh, given your job but uh, let's tackle the question in a more abstract way this question of corona bonds we have a few billion euros more or less here. This is really more a question of symbolism, especially for the for Italy. Does this, does it, is it just do we get support or don't we get support? Doesn't make this the debate very difficult in and of itself. Yes, that will certainly make the debate more difficult because this is a debate that has already been uh, led for 10 years. Everybody already has a position on those on bonds like this. And people are very entrenched in their positions. So it's very important to have an in, influx of new creative ideas. Also, this idea of unemployment reinsurance systems uh, had been tackled before. It needs debates between member states, uh, especially the proposal by von der Leyen is directly targeting the COVID-19 crisis as a temporary measure. Uh, so it's a little bit different, but of course it would could be it, it, it's think it's possible with Corona bonds. I had announced a, a further an additional political question. I'm pretty sure that you are not going to reply directly. I'm thinking of special legislation being adopted in Hungary. Shouldn't we require a time limit when it comes to implementing those special laws? You should ask, you should ask the European People's Party. This is what I expected. Just to come back to our situation, for weeks we have been discussing how does the European Union cope or not? What is your estimation? Sometimes we 
hear radical statements is the critique concerning Brussels and the EU fair. If we look back, we have such a debate once a decade during the 50s. A lot of people said that is the end, that we have the politics of the empty chair, which changed a lot during the 70s uh, regarding eurosclerosis. A lot of people said this is the end during the 90s. I experienced the difficult debate concerning the euro and, it, and its implementation when we had the financial crisis in 2008. The current generation, once again, to say whether it wants to stick to the European integration. My feeling is, given the health crisis, regional and national authorities are requested. I'm also thinking of our important health system. We have had this situation for five or six weeks. We talk about a lot of money coming from the ESM and also with regard to unemployment reinsurance. We cannot say that there is no solidarity, solidarity coming from the European Union. You would say it's too early. Once a decade, we have this question, but it of course also depends of those who are acting politically, who will of course have to prove that they can cope, as this has been the case after the financial crisis. And if you say those who act politically, you think of those being in the capitals, or do you think of Brussels? Do you think of the Commission and Parliament, the European Parliament? The last major crisis of the European Union came from the member states. I'm thinking of the euro. I'm thinking of financial policy in some member states. I'm thinking of migration waves, which weren't under control. And I'm thinking of the current situation. Therefore, member states have to show more solidarity. For some, this might be more difficult. But at the end, we should be successful. It's not going to come overnight. The solution is not going to come overnight. And we need some, some time. They also have to legitimate themselves in their national parliaments. My feeling is that member states will achieve a good result in the end. And, and the European Parliament plays a decisive role as uh, a lot of things require legislation. The next big subject and topic will be the planning of the multi-annual financial framework. Very often people think the heads of states decide. No, it is an interinstitutional agreement between the Council and the European Parliament. So we need to, the votes of both. Parliament can accept a proposal or not, and it's going to be decisive. That's financial means put at our disposal during the next year will help us to recover from the crisis. Nobody talks about a Marshall Plan yet. We don't use the term yet, but maybe this is a factor we can come back to. Mr. Welly, I thank you very much indeed for this discussion. Enjoy your soup or your cup of coffee, and don't hesitate to continue the discussion through Skype. Or you can also, of course, just remain silent, which can also be very good. Thank you.